station. This is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Houston, this is station. I'm ready for the event. U.S. Embassy in Kiev, Ukraine. This is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Station, this is Ambassador Jovanovich from the U.S. Embassy in Kiev, Ukraine. How do you hear me? Madam Ambassador, I hear you loud and clear. And to you and to the students of America House, welcome to the International Space Station. Well, I, I think that um, you can see we've got a really excited audience here um, in, in Kyiv. There's a bunch of people, Americans, Ukrainians, and everybody's thrilled to be talking to you tonight. So we've collected questions from all over Ukraine, from people eager to hear about your adventures in outer space and any advice you have for aspiring scientists and engineers. And I can tell you from our pre-talk, there are a bunch of them here of all ages, not just, uh, not just youth. I think there are others as well. So our first question comes from Kostya in Kyiv. He asks, what kind of training did you do to become an astronaut? Well, we select astronauts with a bunch of varied backgrounds. We've got astrophysicists, engineers, medical doctors, test pilots. We've got the whole gamut. I've got Joe Acaba here. He's a teacher, an educator. And so we all come with all a bit different backgrounds, but we get the similar astronaut training where we have to learn about the systems of, for example, the space station, the science on the space station, how the toilet works. Um, we have to learn about how to fix things. We have to learn about the experiments that we do on, this, on the uh, science equipment. We have to learn how to do spacewalks. We have to learn how to be able to ride the rocket uphill and ride the rocket downhill. So there's a wide variety of stuff that happens when you're an astronaut. And the neat part is, is you never know what you're going to be doing from day to day um, and how different the different days are going to be. So it's, it's a lot of different things, but that's what makes the job so interesting and so challenging. So is there, um, this is a question from Alina in, in Ripchak, Ukraine, and it really follows on to what you just said. She'd like to know what is the most important thing about being an astronaut? The most important thing about being an astronaut is that you get along with other people. I mentioned that we have these varied backgrounds and varied experiences, but when we come up here as part of a crew, we have to be able to work together. And it can be busy, it can be stressful, it can be long days, but you got to be able to understand yourself, relate to other people, and figure out how to work as cohesively as a crew to be able to get the mission done. So that's what we find and we try and really check out when we go ahead and hire people is what kind of person are they and would we want to be on a mission with them for a long time be able to get the job done. Well, that's really interesting because I bet a lot of people in this room thought the same thing I did, which is it, it was not going to be the old interpersonal skills issue. It was going to be something about science or math, um, which are, of course, also very important for your mission. So Bogdan in Kiev wants to know, what is the future of space exploration? The future of space exploration is pretty darn exciting right now. We've got, you know, companies that are building new space vehicles. You know, in, in the U.S. alone, we've got the Boeing and the SpaceX company that are building crewed capsules that are going to come up here to the space station here, hopefully by uh, next year. Uh, and that'll allow uh, NASA to finish our Orion vehicle, which will start taking us out beyond low Earth orbit and start taking us out towards the moon and towards Mars. And, you know, that's the kind of stuff that we need to be doing to be able to continue exploring and eventually get onto Mars. Um, and the fact that no country is going to go alone to Mars, it's going to be a human effort. We're going to have to do an international partnership just like we do with the International Space Station. And that's why it's so important the work we do here, forging the alliances and, and the partnership and, and making it all work country to country, that there's going to be an example for us when we go ahead and go and try and do that major Earth, you know, exploration mission from the people that live here to another heavenly body like Mars and go check it out, hopefully in the near future. <laughs> Exciting. And I, I just, um, since, since you put that little capsule out there, I just have to ask a follow-up question. So how is it that you're just hanging there and not, you know, kind of uh, rolling around in space? Are you like, are, are, I mean, are your, your uh, feet in, in stirrups or something? What's the secret? Foot stirrups.
magic. <laughs> so, um, a leg from Venezia would like to know if you are growing plants on the space station, and if so, why are you doing that? Great question. And we have astronaut Joe Caba, who has been growing lettuce. Five different types of lettuce he's been growing here on the space station. And we're about to harvest it come this Friday. Um, why are we doing that? Because as you can imagine, food takes a lot of space and weight. And if we're going to go on a long duration mission, we're going to have to have a pretty big spaceship to be able to feed the people while we go there. But if we imagine a seed, doesn't take a whole lot of space or a whole lot of weight. And if we can figure out how to grow a lot of our food, then that makes it a lot easier to build a spaceship to have more scientific stuff, more propulsion, or more maybe a, a rec recreation room on our spaceship like you see in all the movies. Uh, so that's really important to be for our sustainability, not only en route to another planet, but maybe once we get there. Well, I bet it'll be pretty nice on Friday night to have that fresh lettuce. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, our, a former colleague of ours uh, from the U.S. Embassy, Regine Stokes, is wondering what the solar eclipse back in August, what did that look like from your vantage point in the International Space Station? For us, we, uh, none of us had ever seen a solar eclipse from space because they don't happen that often. And we were amazed that we've got this sea of normally uh, white clouds or the blue of the ocean and there's, there's usually a kind of a, a white tint to everything because the sun's lighting up the, the uh, atmosphere. Well, there was this huge, just black circle. And we were amazed at the size of the shadow of the, of the uh, moon uh, onto the surface. And I mean, inside that circle, I mean, big bright white clouds and, and earth around it, but it was just black. And it really altered the colors of the things on the other side of, of, the, of the, uh, the umbra or, or the shadow of the moon. And then we also had uh, special filters on our cameras that allow us to take pictures actually of the sun. And we had to, an opportunity to see the, the sun on, on three passes. Um, and to see the sun you know, get absorbed by uh, you know, the moon's shadow was really, really neat. And we were able to you know, take pictures uh, just like you guys did on the ground um, and, and see the eclipse. Well, that sounds really, really cool. So uh, Elena in Kiev wants to know how you spend your free time in space when there's not a solar eclipse. <laughs> um, for me, um, most of my free time is, is spent trying to take pictures of our, of our amazing, beautiful planet. Um, it's so amazing to see. And, and you just, you're so changed by the experience of being able to look down and know that you know, every minute of your life and everyone you've ever known is down there underneath you and, and you're moving along at you know six miles or 10 kilometers every second going around the earth every 90 minutes it, it's it's just every orbit is different the weather's different the sun is different and so we're up there just taking pictures so that we can try and do our best to share it with all of you on the ground because unfortunately we've only had 500 something humans uh, going to space so far and we need those new vehicles and then and boom in the space exploration business so that a lot more people can see it and be uh, experience the beauty of our planet from, from up here as well. That's a really inspiring answer. Um, thank you. So here's here's a going from the really serious to um, something a little lighter and a little uh, perhaps more fun. Kirill from Harkeith asks if you could show us something interesting, like maybe how you drink a cup of coffee or wash your hair in space, or I don't know what. <laughs> well, since I, I already showered, we'll go ahead and try. This is uh, some, some apple cider. And you notice we have to have it, you know, we, we bring it up dry, we add water to it. And then our straws have to have a lock, because if they didn't, the liquid would just come out. But water behaves a little differently in space. Oh, look at it go already. All right. So. We let it go, you can see the water just comes up and forms a bubble.
and you can see that it just floats. And so the surface tension holds it all together. And so we try to be careful about using our locks on our drinks so that we don't splatter our buddies. Does it taste the same? Yeah, um, for me, the drinks taste the same. Your taste buds get uh, altered a little bit uh, when you get up here. Things seem, for most people, a little blander. And so sauces are a way to make the food feel uh, a little more like home when you, when you eat them. Uh, Yulia in ivana Frankivsk would like to know how much longer you will be stationed on the International Space Station. You've already been there four months, is that right? And what you're going to be doing next? Well, our crew on uh, Soyuz 51S with Sergei Rosansky and, and Paolo Nespoli will leave on December 14th. And we'll land in Kazakhstan uh, that day. And then Sergei will go back to Moscow. Paolo and I will head back to Houston. And then we'll go through uh, a phase where we'll be getting our bodies rehabilitated back to gravity, we'll be doing all the medical testing because the size isn't just in glove boxes or, or on test stands or going on outside. We, we are the science too. Because I mentioned about needing food for a long journey. Well, we also need to protect the human bodies because there's radiation, there's lack of gravity, which causes our bodies to change. And so the part of the experimentation is, is us ourselves. So we'll be getting back, rehabilitating and reconditioning ourselves. We're doing medic, get all the medical tests done on us. Then we'll be getting debriefed, explaining to everybody what we learned, what we saw, helping train the next set of astronauts that'll be coming up here and taking care of this magnificent space station. And then uh, the thing I look forward to the most is uh, spending time with my wife and kids. And uh, it's been a long time training and, and time up here apart. And so getting some good family time is, is what I'll look forward to the most. That's great. So I have uh, a question for you. Wh when you went up into space, you get so much preparation. What surprised you the most? What surprised me the most was something I, I had a feeling for after my first flight, um, but I was only up here 11 days and it was such a, a whirlwind. Um, but being up here now you know, three months, it, it amazes me how the human body can adapt to this environment so quickly. You know, just like, uh, you know, people adapt to swimming underwater or, or diving and that type of neutral buoyancy. Um, I'm just amazed that we can be working, you know, up on this surface and it seems perfectly normal that this is straight ahead and that's the ceiling and that's the floor. But then one of our buddies could be over here working on this surface and that's, you know, normal for him. And we see guys floating by and flying by in different attitudes and it seems perfectly normal and you just you adapt to it so quickly and it really only takes the human body you know a couple days to where our minds know exactly where to if i want to go over this way i know where to push and it'll just send me over and if i need to go back i just know in the right spot and i push back and we can control our rotations and our spinning and everything and it just it is so natural our bodies are made for it to be able to go ahead and adapt to this environment and so in my opinion the human body is special and that doesn't take something special to be an astronaut. Any one of you could be up here because your body is made for it. Well, I, I think that that's a, a, an amazing answer, both the visuals and, and, uh, and your words, that any one of us could be uh, an astronaut. And so I actually did want to ask you, do you have a, a special message or special advice for aspiring astronauts in Ukraine? Certainly the, the thing that, that I've seen from the people that I know that have become astronauts is that even before they became astronauts, they loved what they did. They were passionate about a lot, most of them, you know, we all want to learn new things, we learn something new every day. You know, we all studied hard in school, found a field that we were interested in, whether it's geology or for me, I was a, my degree was in mathematics um, or you know, and became a test pilot. Uh, other people, it is, you know, hard sciences. Um, and, and trying to figure things out and learning more things, always being thirsty for knowledge is, is a trait that, that, you know, all the astronauts and cosmonauts that I know have. And that's what helps us in our job to be able to be good scientists up here, um, good crew members, good engineers, and figure problems out, uh, make experiments work, and ultimately take all these myriad of different things that we do and make it all work into the getting the mission done and sustaining our presence here in low Earth orbit. 
So one of um, we we kind of pulled the room to ask uh, other questions that people might have on their minds. One question was, how do you feel mentally up there? Um, is it is it a challenge being up there? Um, we have a funny thing, you know, when you forget something or something like that, we call it the space stupids. Um, Fortunately, it, 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 at least for, in, in my experience, it, it hasn't happened uh, that much. I, I don't, we, we do mental acuity tests, and I, I'm always curious to see if I've changed at all. Uh, but you get used to working up here, and there's always different things going on, so you stay really agile. And, and um, I don't think, you know, at least I haven't observed that any of my crew members, any, any cognitive or, or mental changes. Uh, certainly, you get used to working you know, the long days and the, and, and the hours, and you really need downtime at the end of the day to be able to, you know, whether it's you know, converse with other people on email, call your friends and family, or just relax and watch a TV show or a movie to give your a brain a break from the high-paced uh, you know, daily activities that we have. So we had another question. Does space trash crash into the space station? Mm -hmm. Or do you have to like avoid it somehow? There's not as much space trash in this lower Earth orbit that space station's in because we're, we're going around the Earth at 17,500 miles an hour. So we're moving pretty quick. So stuff would have to be able to, you know, uh, have its own engine kind of to be able to stay in this lower Earth orbit. Because we, we do that. We reboost our orbit and, and stay in this lower orbit. But there is a lot of space trash farther out, where all the satellites are, where there's expended boosters or dead satellites and things like that. Eventually, their orbit decays and comes through the low Earth orbit that space station's at. And every once in a while, we've got people tracking this all the time. It comes to the point where we go, hey, this might get close enough to space station that we want to move, and we'll do a debris avoidance maneuver to move space station out of the way of that space trash as it comes, descends through our, through our orbit. Fortunately, it's nothing like the movie Gravity, um, and doesn't happen very often. But it is something that we're really going to have to think about as we continue more countries become spacefaring nations, and we want to go beyond low Earth orbit through that ring of uh, you know, space trash that we're accumulating up there. So a couple of people are wondering, uh, what do you miss the most? Uh, you, you miss the smells, um, you miss feeling temperature changes and weather changes, you miss different types of foods that you're favorite of, but I think to a person it's, it's the human uh, interaction with the people that you, that you love the most. Your crewmates are great and you really come to, to love your crewmates and get along with them, but they don't make good dancing partners and you know, typically uh, you, uh, you know, we don't hug that much, you know, we're, we're guys. Um, but, uh, you know, to get a hug for my wife or my seven-year-old daughter or my 11-year-old son, you know, that's the stuff that uh, you really miss the most. And uh, what, you know, I know we look forward to is uh, getting back home uh, and, and seeing our families. So uh, this is a, a variation on the theme, and you kind of touched it. What's your biggest food craving? I'd have to say a carbonated beverage um, would be just because it's not only the taste but the sensation. And we don't have that because you don't want to send gas up uh, into space. So uh, that, that probably will be uh, one of my first things that I enjoy besides maybe a, a fresh taco or a juicy hamburger or a piece of pizza. So we see that you have two flags behind you, uh, or to, to the side. One is an American flag and one is the Ukrainian flag. Where did you get the Ukrainian flag? I uh, picked that up last summer when uh, my family and I were in uh, Dnipropetrovsk. Uh, my son was born there, and so uh, we went back there uh, with our whole family, enjoyed a few days there in Novomoskovsk, and, and then uh, also a little bit of time in Kiev. Uh, and so picked the flag up there and brought it with me. And brought it all the way up to space, too. That's great. I think you've got uh, an appreciative audience here. And we'll, <laughs> you've got uh, an appreciative audience here. And we'll, and we'll bring it all the way back, too. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So we had a question about how do you monitor solar activities, and I think especially with regard to, um, to health issues. 
Well, we are fortunate that, you know, there's just six of us up here on a, the world's, you know, biggest, most amazing uh, technological achievement to this date for humans. But there is teams all over the world, you know, we've got the one in Russia, in Moscow, we've got the one in Munich for ESA, we've got the one in Scuba, uh, Japan, outside of Tokyo. Um, we've got the, our Canadians, you know, have a, uh, uh, a mission control for the robotic arm and the opposite they do. And then obviously mission control in Houston. And we've got literally an army of highly dedicated, amazingly talented uh, engineers and operations people that go ahead and monitor all that. And they use the sensors that are outboard on our satellites, um, that are Earth-based, and you know a few sensors that are here on the space station to monitor all those types of things, and let us know if there's anything that we uh, we need to do. And if there is, you know, huge solar flare activity, we do actually have places on space station that are a little more shielded that we'll go ahead and shelter in place at, and wait out the uh, the solar particles. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. A big thank you to all the participants from the U.S. Embassy in Kiev, Ukraine. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communications.